Hello everyone, it's Benny, and in this video we're going to be adding another collider to our physics engine, because right now we just have bounding spheres. And they're not a terrible collider or anything, it's just they aren't ideal in all situations. And I'm going to briefly show you a drawing just to help illustrate what I mean. So, let's say we have a physics scene which consists of these two shapes. One looks sort of like a car, and the other looks, well, looks like something. <laughs> now, right now, we just have bounding spheres. So, if we wanted to have these shapes in our physics engine, we'd have to approximate them as spheres. And we'd get shapes something like this. Now, granted, these aren't terrible approximations of their shape. They roughly cover the size and area of the object, so... They're not terrible, and it's certainly workable. At the same time, though, it can be a lot better. So, another shape that a lot of physics engines have is a box, because boxes can generally approximate shapes like these a lot better than spheres can. For instance, for this sort of car-looking shape, I can have a box. And as you can see, that's a much, much tighter fit around the car and it's much closer to the actual shape. For this thing, I have a box. Again, it's still not perfect, but it's much closer to the actual shape. So these are bounding boxes. And specifically, these are sometimes called oriented bounding boxes, because as you see, they can be rotated. However, in this video, I'm going to implement a slightly different kind of bounding box, called an axis-aligned bounding box. And those are bounding boxes which aren't rotated. They can't be rotated. They have a fixed orientation. And the axis-aligned bounding box for this car, for instance, would be exactly the same. So it still works just fine there. For this thing, however, the axis-aligned bounding box would be something like this. And as you can see, they're both aligned to, well, in this case, the X and Y of my screen, but you can align them to any coordinate system you like. And the advantage of this is it makes creating and using these a lot simpler and a lot faster. And if you do need to have the oriented bounding box, because it's just axis line bounding box just doesn't get you a good enough approximation, really, at that point, you're better off just going with a more advanced collider, like a convex hull or something, that's better at approximating the shape. So, yeah, axis line bounding boxes, they're, whoops, they're fast, they're simple, and they're better approximation for some shapes. So, let's implement axis aligned bounding boxes. And, like before, I went ahead and I created a basic header file and CPP file for axis line bounding boxes, just because it saves a little bit of video time. So how are we going to store our axis line bounding box? Well, we're going to have, well, first off, we're going to be using vectors, just like with bounding spheres. So I'm going to include Math3D, which has my vector classes. And as before, the particular vector class doesn't matter that much. You can use any vector class or write your own. But I'm using this one, because it's there. So, Got a vector 3f, and there's a lot of ways you can represent this. I'm going to represent an axis line bounding box with the min extent, whoops, and the max extent. So essentially, these two points are the corners. If I was representing it in this 2D representation, it would be this point and this point for this car, and this point and this point for this. So that's how we're representing it, with the two extreme corners. And of course, in this case, the two extreme corners I've chosen are the one with the smallest values and the corner with the biggest values. And there. And as before, I'm going to write getters and setters off screen, just to save a bit of video time. Okay, so like I said, I went ahead and created the constructor and the getters for our AABB class off screen. But I also decided to include intersectData.h and write 
the prototype for our intersect AABB function. And the reason for that is that's going to be our next goal. We need some way to determine if this AABB is intersecting some other AABB. So let's go ahead and go to the implementation file and let's implement it. Now, determining if two AABBs intersect is a little bit trickier than determining if two spheres intersect, because there's a little bit of a trick to it. Let's say I have these two AABBs right here. The trick is, if there's space between them on any axis, then they cannot possibly be intersecting, because it doesn't matter if this AABB is infinitely tall or infinitely deep or goes infinitely far the other way, and same thing for this one. It doesn't matter if it's infinitely tall, infinitely deep, or goes infinitely far the other way. There's a gap between them right here. And therefore, there, because there's a gap between them, they cannot possibly be intersecting. And that's the trick. So, how do we determine if there's a gap between the AABBs? And this is why I chose the min extent, max extent representation. This is the min extent of this AABB, this is the max extent of it, this is the min extent of the other AABB, and this is the max extent of it. If I take the min extent of the other AABB and subtract the max extent of this AABB, well, that'll give me the distance on x, and the distance on y, and the distance on z, if there is any. And it's that simple. It's just a vector subtract operation, and that gets you the distance between them on each axis. And it is that simple. So I'm going to have a vector 3f, I'm going to call distances, and that's going to equal other aabb dot, or excuse me, it's just other, dot get max extent minus m, wait, I actually have that backwards. It's other dot get min extents, excuse me, minus our max extents. And that gets us the distance on all the axes. Almost. What if I swapped the position of these two AABBs? In that case, well, well, they wouldn't quite be accurate. We might need, for instance, to take the max or the min extent of this, this right here, minus the max extent of the other to get the distance. So I'm going to call this distances 1. I'm going to duplicate this and create a distances 2. And this is going to start with our min extents, and we're going to subtract the other dot get max extents. And the way we're going to get the actual distances is with a max operation. So distance is 1 dot max, which apparently I don't have written, with distance is 2. Why? Well, we want, we want the largest number. We want whatever is the biggest. And the reason we want that is because, for instance, if I do it the way that's correct here, this one minus this one, the x distance, for instance, is positive. But if I do it the quote-unquote wrong way for this one, and take the this minus this, that'll give me a positive number, or excuse me, a negative number. So that, that'll be less than zero. So therefore, to get the correct one, I just have to take the biggest one, and that'll get me the proper value. But apparently I don't have a max function written for vectors, so one moment. Okay, so I went ahead and wrote this function off screen in my vector class just showing you in case you don't have one as well. It's very simple. It's just going through every component of the vector and selecting whichever one is biggest. And it's that simple. And of course, after that returns the result. And there, so now that we have that, I'm actually going to leave that open for a moment. I'm, oh, I'm, in, the wrong, I'm in the wrong file. Now we have a vector which has the distance between the two AABBs on each axis. So now I'm going to have some float I'm going to call max distance, and that's going to equal whichever component is biggest. And my vector class has a max function 
which takes no parameters, which does exactly that. And that's why I left that open. Granted, this would probably be better named something like Max Val, but, well, this is what I have it named. And it looks something like this. It's just going through every component and selecting whichever value is biggest. And, okay. Now I can... Sure, now I can give rid of that. So now we know what distance is the biggest. And that's enough information to determine if the two AABBs are intersecting. And also, as a bonus, we also we already have the distance, so we don't need to go through any extra hoops to calculate that. So I'm going to return intersect data, and if max distance is greater than zero, excuse me, is less than zero, only then can we possibly be intersecting. Why? Because if the max distance is greater than zero, then therefore there's some amount of distance between it on some axis, and well, we can't be intersecting. And I'm going to return max distance as that. And there we go, folks. We have an intersect AABB function. It's, it's that simple. <laughs> it, it does take a little bit of thinking, but the end method isn't really that difficult. So there. Now all we have to do is, of course, run through some tests to make sure everything's working. And as with bounding spheres, I'm going to do that off-screen. Okay, so I went ahead and wrote out some basic test code. This is what it looks like if you want to copy it and try it out for yourself. It's also on GitHub, as with everything. And if I run it, it returns values that look something like this. But as before, pictures are a lot nicer. So if we were drawing these out, this is something what it's kind of like what it would look like. The first AABB would look something like this. And number two would be right here. As you see, it's just, it's perfectly diagonal away. Their corners are perfectly touching, but the AABBs are not intersecting. And our thing here reflects that. There is, they are not intersecting, there is no distance between them, but, well, yeah. The next one is right next to it on one side, so the faces are perfectly touching, but they're still not intersecting. And our test reflects that. They're not intersecting, and there's no distance between them. For our next one, it is one unit away on one axis, and it's still not touching. Again, our test reflects that. They're not intersecting, and there's one unit between them. And our final test, it's about halfway up and it's still intersecting. So then, again, our test reflects that. They're intersecting, and there's negative 0.5 distance between them. And as with spheres, that distance represents the penetration distance, so the distance between this part of this AABB and this part of the other AABB. And that is correct. There's 0.5 distance, or, well, yeah, distance of penetration. So, excellent. It is safe to say our AABB class is working properly. We can now have spheres that intersect over spheres, and AABBs that interact with other AABBs. But what about AABBs interacting with spheres? And well, we don't have anything that does that just yet. And we could go ahead and write a method that does AABB and sphere intersection. But you might have already noticed there's a bit of a problem with this. What if we add another collider? Then we need methods to intersect that with every other collider in the scene. And Every collider, yeah. It's just every collider needs to intersect with every other collider. And that can very, very quickly become a, a messy scenario. So, although AABBs and spheres are nice colliders to have, you have to be careful about how many colliders you choose to add to your physics engine, because if you add too many, you very quickly end up with a big, gigantic combinatorial explosion. So be careful with that. Other than that, I think that just about wraps things up for this video. So, thank you. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned. And in the next video, we're going to be doing a little bit... We're going to be finishing up a little bit of colliders. We might not finish up entirely, but we'll be sort of starting to wrap things up. So thank you. See you then.